we had all together uh, 15 students spread across three different kinds of institutions and three different kinds of courses. So Mark's, Mark teaches at a community college and he was teaching an intro to international relations class with four students who in theory were all physically present, but in practice were present virtually or physically depending on the day. I had an upper level European history course in Age of World War class, um, which I was teaching because the people in it were graduating and had to have it. And so my Dean told me to teach it even though there were just two people in it. Uh, and both of those are content courses. Jeff's was a little different. So Jeff, oh, do you want to talk about yours? Yeah, mine was just different is a fun way to say downright strange. I ended up with nine of them. Only one had any background in history at all or any interest in history coming into this at all and were somewhat hoodwinked into this class. So it took some selling to get them in and definitely or one of them had a background in reacting and that was it. It was a face to face Tuesday, Thursday class motivated students but maybe this wasn't their thing. The question, we want to play a game. We believe in games deeply. We had games that at least for Mark and I met our content goals of the course, um, but we couldn't do it ourselves. And that Mark came up with is to find a game that could be easily run asynchronously uh, that met our content goals and worked for Jeff. And so Mark and I had played uh, Europe on the Brink asynchronously. And so we had some experience with it um, and we knew that it would work asynchronously. And the asynchronous part was important because our classes met at different times of the day and there was no way we were going to be able to all get together on Zoom. Um, and that's just something to file away for talk later about are there ways we can facilitate um, a kind of dating app for games where we can meet, where we can connect people or teaching roughly at the same time, or even coordinate class offerings for the coming semester that will make this possible. So that's a, a breadcrumb trail to follow later. In our case, that was not possible. And so we decided to do it asynchronously. We decided to use discourse rather than Slack because that's what Mark uh, preferred. Uh, and that's fine with me. I haven't used Slack for quite a while, or Discord for a while, but it's not that hard to figure out and it seemed to work for Jeff. Yeah. Um, and so we started. Uh, and so we did a fair amount of talking about how this was going to work. Um, and some of that was logistics. Things like, when are we going to end one round and start another? How are we going to identify players and factions and so on? and about how to introduce ourselves and introduce the game, right? So the yeah. faction question, we really decided, we decided that the best way to do it was to have each campus be one faction or have a faction or two, but not to try and create factions that crossed campuses. Mm -hmm. And the purpose for that is that even though, at least for me, uh, and Jeff, you can talk about it in a second, is for me, that meant that my class time could be used to play the game mm -hmm. in a way where I could use it for debate and discussion without having to worry about having separate factions in the same room. Um, uh, and so that worked well for me, Jeff. I don't. The situation is a little bit different for you. So you want to say something yes. about that? Um, having three factions within mind because we got nine, and if you haven't played Europe on the Brink, you end up three in a faction as standard. Um, it was important that, uh, especially for students who hadn't done reacting before, that they could do things and they could engage and get feedback and coordinate within their factions in real time. And why I think it works so well is the, the choice of game. It fit Kelly and Mark's content goals. I don't do much in European history by much. I mean, nothing, but um, it, I knew enough and could get enough into World War One that I could say it it makes sense that um, as this July crisis was going on, there wasn't, there was real time discussions within factions, within countries, but there wasn't real time discussion necessarily across factions. So we were in some ways making the, the asynchronous and even different meeting times of the class 
more of a feature than a bug of the game. Because you could have, if Russia really wanted to reach out to Austria-Hungary for some reason, they weren't just picking up the phone and doing it. They would have to, okay, ambassador, send this. And then when will we hear back? Will they meet at this time? Okay, then watch in the Discord server and we'll get a response at this time. So this kind of um, added to the liminality of the, the game. Now it did create a little bit of problems in that, okay, um, Germany, France, and Russia, they are close enough. So what I ended up having to do was um, separate them. I got two in different corners of the room and I sent another to a hallway. And so that way they weren't sitting and overhearing and listening and having that real time advantage within the game. Um, another question that we had to talk about in terms of planning this out is how we were gonna do the preparation and the debrief. And what we ended up doing is deciding that the three instructors would all zoom into each class collectively to introduce ourselves, to get to meet the students who were at places that, at, at other campuses than where we were at, and to make sure each group of people heard a kind of common set of background ideas. Um, Partly that's because Mark and I, although one, uh, he's a political scientist, I'm a historian, and both of us have a kind of professional research interest in the field. Jeff's interest is different. Um, partly because my class was so small that we really only did this two times because my students could, I just canceled class one day and had my students zoom into one of the other classes. Um, that's a little more work. But I do think it paid off in the sense that people got comfortable with each other and with the instructors and we were able to give some background. We actually did the same thing for the debrief where Jeff and I Zoom or Mark and I zoomed into Jeff's and Mark's classroom and had essentially a parallel debrief discussions, uh, which my students joined again because I had so few people that were flexible enough to make one or the other. Um, as you pick games if you're doing this kind of collaboration, recognize that differing levels of experience with the game and expertise in the content are going to mean different kinds of experiences for you um, and different kinds of preparations that you may need to do both individually and a group. The fact that your courses may have different goals. Um, Jeff's course was really different from Mark yeah. and mine. Um, Mark and mine actually played out pretty well. I'm a genocide studies person. I read a lot of political science. And so ours synced fairly well. I'm not sure how that worked with Jeff. So I'll stop talking now. And Jeff, you can riff on these first two bullets. Okay. I, I would say for these, these first two, okay, different level of experience. I had one person in my class who had any background in reacting. He had a, a good amount, but I had others who they... They brought their own experiences in some parallel, I say parallel things. Uh, one of them played a lot of D&D &D and a lot of, another one played a lot of just um, a tabletop board games. So they, they had some of that. And I had, before we played this game, I was able to get what were formerly known as Flashpoint games and run some of that just by um, bringing in other people so that they could get a little bit of background in game mechanics. But if they had had none, it would have been quite difficult. And if mine had been asynchronous and had none, it, it could have been overwhelming. So that was something I, I'm glad that that wasn't necessarily a factor for mine, but it might be a factor that you would have to consider. Um, and then how does it meet your course goals? One of my course goals in doing this is they were writing their own reacting game. My class was, and they did it. We actually just ran it this week and a week before it's a, uh, 2016 election game, a student written game, and boy, did it do something. And one, I wanted them to see how different mechanics could work. And I wanted them to see how games could also potentially be broken. And this provided that. And as far as mechanics go, in their 2016 election game, it has a Discord feature. Everyone is plugged into Discord and there's a Twitter server within their Discord. So you can have Twitter running in the back and so this accomplished that. And I was like, yeah, they were all comfortable with Discord, even though on the first day of class, when I asked them that one person knew anything. So this hit my goals in um, yeah, ways that were different from the others. 
if you have multiple classes, you often have to put in, you have to rethink about deadlines. So it's not just by the end of this class, it needs to be this. You have to think, okay, when can this be submitted that the GMs have enough time to do what we need to do, that players have enough time to see it and react and prepare for the next one. It takes a, a little bit longer and a little bit more forethought in organizing the schedule in order to make that work across multiple classes, multiple meeting times and multiple modalities. And the, what goes hand in hand with this is it requires a lot of monitoring. Um, <clears throat> Mark tended to be our main GM with Kelly and I jumping in there. The, the out of game actions tended to be, he would do videos of him rolling the dice and showing these features that had come in. Whereas Kelly and I tended to be more putting out fires. Like this post just happened. A GM needs to respond. Okay. I'm on that. And uh, especially if it was in within the factions that fell within our classroom, we felt like we could jump on that. But if you're going to be doing this across uh, multiple classrooms, especially if you're doing different modalities with that, it's, in my opinion, it's a good idea to have multiple GMs and even ideas for, okay, who's going to be watching what and when, who, uh, I don't want to say a, a babysitting schedule, but uh, during these key hours, who's going to be there to be taking care of this and who's going to be communicating what things to players and when. You don't want to just leave it to chance. It means you really have to know your IM and you have to know when the interventions are going to happen and how they might need to be modified. The real challenge from a standard assignments perspective is the differing goals and outcomes for the course, right? So I think it would have been much easier. I mean, I think we basically compromised and kept basically the standard assignments, but to be truer to the course outcomes, I think Mark's assignments would have had to be different than mine. Um, and if that's that's a challenge, if you're working across disciplines, I don't think it's that much of a problem if you're working within disciplines, but that's something to think about. Along with that, I do think it's easier, even if the class times are different, if you're the same days, right? So I think it made our job easier that it was all Tuesday, Thursday, rather than one of us being Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and one of us being Tuesday, Thursday. I think you could do it, but this is easier. We tried hard to make people at all of the campuses comfortable with all of us. Yeah, I don't think we managed that. Um, and it's not that they hated us, but it's very, I felt like it was very clear if Jeff's students had questions, they went to Jeff. If mine went to had questions, they went to me and so on. And so that's one of the issues about sharing GM duties is how do you make sure that other students at other campuses are willing to reach out to you if they have questions and you're kind of the GM on duty? And I don't have an answer to that question. That's just something to think about. This was hard, but I think it was valuable and I would do it again. And I rarely, I do, but rarely see questions on the Facebook lounge about how do you make this with work with a hundred people? And the answer is always to go find Joe Shramick. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I often have people at reaching out and asking how do you play this game or that game with five or 10 or 12 players? And so I think this is a really valuable option. And the trick is, how to provide people a way to link up with each other with sufficient time to make it work, right? And so one of the things that happened with us, I don't remember exactly the same the day it happened, Jeff, but it was not that far before the beginning of the semester when Mark reached out to me. And so the trick is, I think, how we can create a system where if it's a spring semester, you can be talking with people about this as a possibility in November, not in January. We see that all the time. The how do I make this work with 12? And it's so many times you end up modifying the games in ways that it, it, it's a fundamentally different game and things are missing. So the more I think we can find a system and kind of fine tune a system that allows for um, inner university, inner college cooperation, I, I think the better. The other thing that I, I would, I guess, finish with this is the people at my university who heard about this, that we were doing this, it, it got a lot of 
positive feedback, even from administration that I wasn't necessarily expecting. They were really interested in, oh, you have a inner university collaboration on an innovative new pedagogy. Yep. That was something like, yes, in my mind, it's, I mean, Kelly and Mark and I are working together to fix a problem, but if you need to put that in administrative speak, fantastic. Um, and so the, I think this is one more thing that also highlights the potential versatility of this pedagogy, which is one of the things that it's not often credited for is its versatility. So I would just end on that. Yeah, I will uh, repeat that. Praise hands abound. I'm going to add on one more thing and then I'm going to take us take us to discussion slash Q&A. But this is from Mark because I got to speak to him really quickly before he had to run off. And it's just an additional note on communication, uh, which he wanted me to pass on, which was, uh, yeah, about thinking through the logistical aspects of communication. And this inf just Im further emphasizes what both Kelly and Jeff mentioned, which is um, having a plan for every aspect. And, and as they mentioned, Mark was sort of taking the lead as like a more lead GM at certain times. And he mentioned, he realized very quickly, oh gosh, I really wish I had everyone's students' email addresses because so much of the game communication was happening, you know, on Discord, obviously, but he wanted before the student signed on to Discord to have been able to either warn them about something, ask them about something, prompt them towards something, et cetera. So I just wanted to pass that on. 